the game so we will not get lost videos okay so the next thing will be hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy so what is this idea of hokum guys tell me please will the hokum murmur increase or decrease if i increase the blood inside of the heart if i put more blood inside of the heart what will happen to the hokum murmur hokum is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy excellent it will be decreased okay so the next thing here you can see it's 60% uh, to 70% of the cases are familial uh, it's autosomal dominant and most commonly due to a mutation in a gene and that genes will encode to sarcomeric proteins like myosin binding to protein C and B, uh, beta myosin heavy chains well, what is this stuff I'm speaking about well, if you take a look at the picture I just sent you guys, um, not long ago, this one, uh, yeah, this one, you can see the myosin chain here, and uh, and and that can help you uh, like realize uh, the the importance of the myosin here. Okay, let's go back here. So. We have uh, uh, um, the following, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, it's uh, due to uh, mutation in the myosin uh, binding protein C and the beta myosin, basically the heavy chains, that's the most important thing to know. But if you get a question which one is most common, you must know that dilated cardiomyopathy is much more common than hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. So you might have known this young uh, the question would be like this some young boy who was running on the field he plays soccer or something and then gets a single they bring him to the emergency department you listen to his heart you hear like a crescendo decrescendo murmur at the left external border and the murmur is better when when you when he sequats the murmur is much better why when he sequats the murmur is much better? Can someone tell me? Increased preload and increased afterload. Yep, exactly. So in hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, um, um, the, the murmur will improve. Which other pathology can have improvement of the murmur, guys? Excellent, MVB, good. So here they write, it can cause syncope during exercise and may lead to sudden death in young athletes due to ventricular arrhythmias. So it can lead to ventricular arrhythmias. That's super important to know. Why? Because it disturbs the conduction system. Okay, what are the findings? The ventricle is quite stiff. So if he's really stiff, you will hear an S4, dilated S3, stiff s4 dilated obstructive like thick thin thick thin thick also the murmur will be systolic crescendo decrescendo sounds exactly like which other heart murmur aortic stenosis correct yeah and you can see uh, the the, the um, yeah, it may see mitral regurg due to an impaired mitral valve closure. What do they mean by that? I will show you guys. So, take a look here. This is your left atrium. Yes. So, take, take a look here. You have, this is your left atrium. This is your left ventricle. And this is your aorta, the outflow. The hypertrophy, in case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, you must know, it is not generalized. It is localized to the septum, okay? To the septum of the heart, which is this portion. If the intraventricular septum is enlarged, and what else is enlarged? The, what, is, what else is like abnormal? The anterior leaflet of the mitral valve is abnormal it's and uh, it's um it's being like uh moved forward so which leaflet the anterior leaflet 
Okay, so the heart is contracting. Let's imagine there is contraction of the heart. When the heart tries to contraction, pushing of the blood, well, there was a little bit of closure, but after the pushing, you have totally occluded the outflow tract. So if this happens, there will be zero blood flow to where? To coronary artery and to your brain. What will happen to you? For that second, I mean. Syncope. Syncope will occur. Yes, exactly. So, um, because of that, when this occlusion happens, you can get a syncope, a transient syncope. It will not kill you immediately, but it can lead you to get a syncope. After the syncope occurs, the heart readjusts his, himself and get more blood inside of the ventricle, which will allow it to, to function better. So, how come an increased preload improve the symptoms? Imagine if you have more blood here. More blood will stretch the walls of the ventricle, allow a bit to a better opening of the left ventricle. So that will help a lot. Okay, so you can see here the following. So um, they write for us, it's a diastolic dysfunction. So if we say a diastolic dysfunction, is it a problem in contractility or in relaxation? exactly it's relaxation so it's marked ventricular concentric hypertrophy so if it is concentric hypertrophy uh, remember we spoke about eccentric it was in series eccentric series and uh, concentric would be, will be parallel keep in mind the picture i just sent for you parallel that will be concentric parallel concentric while in eccentric that series Okay, so it's often septal predominance, as we saw in the picture. It's mostly only the septum is affected. And the patient will have myofibri uh, myofibrillar disarray and fibrosis. What is this? It's a histological finding, guys. Let's take a look at it. So the disarray, basically, it means that uh, there is poor localization. Uh, just a sec. Yes, as you can see, the heart is highly unorganized. Every freaking um, cardiomyocyte is going to its own place. So we call that a disarray, okay? It's like just a chaos happening. And when you see that chaos, it's basically telling you what? Disarray, okay. So um, moving on, we have uh, what else they write for us? Uh, they write the following. It's often septal predominance and myofibrillar disarray and fibrosis can be seen. The physiology of HOCOM include the following. Asymmetric septal hypertrophy and systolic anterior motion of the mitral valve. We just saw that. So that anterior uh, motion of the uh, valve will lead to occlusion of what? The outflow tract. So an outflow tract obstruction can ensue and dyspnea and possible syncope can occur okay so it, it seems quite simple if you have no blood going to uh, your um, uh, brain basically what will happen to you transient syncope okay good so um, um, other causes of concentric left ventricular hypertrophy include what uh, notice here, uh, it could be chronic, uh, chronic hypertension or Friedreich ataxia. So uh, you are like, how can I differentiate between chronic hypertension, Friedreich ataxia, and HOCOM? They, they, if both of them have the similar problem, you know? So the way to differentiate is the localization of the problem. So if the problem is mostly local, uh, localized to the, um, uh, uh, the septum, that's HOCOM. If it's generalized all over the heart, that's hypertension. If it's generalized all over the heart and aso highly associated with ataxia in a patient, well then you are thinking about which one? You are thinking about the Friedrich ataxia. Okay, so uh, the treatment of such a problem, what is the treatment of HOCOM? You want to increase the blood inside of the left ventricle. So, uh, 
high intensity athletes can use beta blockers why beta blocker help can someone write me why beta blocker can help yeah but remember that it can lead to to uh, a bradycardia So when you have a bradycardia, you will have more period during diastole. If that is the case, you will have more left ventricular filling during uh, um, uh, diastole. So um, yeah, exactly, more bleed, uh, bleed load. Okay, yeah, all of your answers are correct. Okay. So also uh, calcium channel blocker, non dihydrobreathing calcium channel blocker by the same mechanism. And um, in, in case of recurrent syncope, you cannot joke a lot with this. You have to implant the defibrillator, okay? Because if his heart is stopped, you need something to be there to give him one more push, basically, yeah? Um, and keep in mind that this defibrillator, uh, it, it, it does not work always. It only works when there is, um, um, the, the, the defibrillator only works when, when it detects absence of heart rhythm. Okay, let's speak about restrictive and infiltrative cardiomyopathy. So restrictive and infiltrative cardiomyopathies. Well, it has different types, but before we speak in them, I just want to make sure you understand these two. Guys, in dilated cardiomyopathy, is it a problem in relaxation or con contraction of the heart? Okay, so in case of HOCOM, is it a problem um, in relaxation or dilatation of the heart? Okay. Uh-huh, okay, so in case of HOCOM, the dilatation, uh, sorry, the hypertrophy is occurring generalized or localized to the septum? Okay, awesome. And what about if we speak about, um, mm, 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 yeah, Hi hypertension, localized, generalized? Okay, good. You get the differences. That's good. Now we speak about restrictive and infiltrative. Basically, any disease that leads to accumulation of a foreign material, that's important. It's not muscle material, it's not myocyte. Any disease that leads to a foreign material accumulation inside of the walls of your uh, heart, like left ventricle mostly. So, for example, post-radiation fibrosis, what is this? Well, basically some patients get radiation. Uh, actually, back in the time, they used to get radiation for acne. I know it's crazy. So the, the, that's a case. Also, they can get, get like radiation for the treatment of cancer and uh, other causes. So all of these can lead to fibrosis of the myocardium, which can lead to a form of an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Um, and if we say the disease is restrictive, it, it means that it prevents relaxation because it's, it's restricting the heart from what? From dilating. Okay, so if the heart cannot dilate, it means he cannot relax. The next disease uh, that can lead to a restrictive cardiomyopathy is something called Loeffler endocarditis. You must know what is this Loeffler endocarditis. It's basically accumulation of eosinophils. So eosinophils are localized within your myocardium and they start accumulating there. It, it is a form of hypersensitivity reaction actually. And I have a picture of it here. You can see here and the eosinophils, well, you can take a look at the cytoplasm, it looks quite pink. And yeah, that's eosinophils. And um, the, the next disease is called endocardial fibroelastosis. It's a thick fibroelastic tissue in the endocardium of a young children. So 
um, endocardial fibroelastosis, thick fibroelastic tissue in the endocardium of young children. So how does it look like? Take a look here. I have a picture of it here. You can see the anterior most portion in a, in a gross picture, all of this uh, like fibrotic tissue inside. And this is a different picture of it. It's just a hereditary disease, that's it. Also amyloidosis uh, can lead to it. Um, yes, they do. But it takes time for them to die. The definitive treatment is like uh, just to um, change the whole heart. And it will not reoccur, that's interesting. So the next one um, is amyloidosis. Mostly, I, we, we spoke about the primary and secondary amyloidosis, all of this stuff. And sarcoidosis, it's most, most common in African-American, young female, uh, in her 30s, actually. They like to make it in her, like she's around 35. And uh, can someone tell me why in sarcoidosis they have overaccumulation, sorry, why they have hypercalcemia? Uh, why? people with sarcoidosis can have hypercalcemia. Yeah, vitamin, the active form of vitamin D will be increased, but how? Okay, yeah, increased conversion of uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D to 125 hydroxy vitamin D. Okay, so you can see here in case of this um, 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 sarcoidosis as well, it can lead to accumulation of granulomas inside of the myocardium, hemochromatosis, accumulation of iron. But keep in mind that we said, uh, yes, accumulation of iron can lead to this. But why, why does hemochromatosis can lead to dilated cardiomyopathy? I told you the reason, do you remember? Why hemochromatosis can lead to dilated cardiomyopathies? Exactly, it's the Fenty reaction, the uh, 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 free radical, uh, leading to a free radical injury. Awesome job, guys. Okay, so the next one, um, go, uh, go something like this. So, hemochromatosis, although dilated cardiomyopathy, is more common. Okay, so the next thing we are going to speak about, so yeah, restrictive, he's unable to relax. If the heart is unable to, the re to relax, relax is diastole, so it's a dysfunction in diastole, not systole. So, it can have a low voltage ECG, despite thick myocardium, why? Because the contraction sucks. And plus, think about it. These uh, electrodes, they are detecting the electrical activity of the heart. So they have to check electricity passing through much worse thickened membrane, uh, thickened walls. And if that is the case, it will be much more difficult for them. So, yeah, the ECG um, uh, QRS, for example, will be much, much, much shorter. The next thing is Doppler endocarditis. It's associated with hyperosinophilic syndrome. The histology will show you an eosinophilic infiltrates inside of the myocardium. I just showed you guys. Can you see these eosinophils? Eosinophils, eosinophils, eosinophils. They look pinkish. And that's Loeffler endocarditis. Okay. Is there anything difficult in, in cardiomyopathies? Do you feel comfortable with this topic? Okay, good. So, um, the next topic for us now is heart failure. So, heart failure is, is quite interesting and it goes something like this. So, the patient, um, on cl classification of heart failure, you can have the following. Let's give you all of the classification of it. You can have systolic heart failure, diastolic heart failure, right heart failure, left heart failure okay heart failure with preserved ejection fraction heart failure with reduced ejection fraction so let me take a look uh, just to make sure I did not forget anything okay okay good 
So, yes, so you have these ones. So you must be comfortable to speak about all of them. If we say a systolic heart failure, guys, what will happen to, uh, um, uh, is the problem with the contraction or with the relaxation? In case of systolic heart failure, contraction, good. Well, in case of diastolic heart failure, it's a problem in relaxation, correct? So, guys, what will happen to the cardiac output in case of systolic heart failure? Cardiac output. It will decrease. What will happen to the cardiac output in case of ejection fraction? Let me put it for you in a different way. What will happen to the ejection fraction in case of systolic heart failure? Okay, what will happen to the ejection fraction in case of diastolic heart failure? Diastolic heart failure. It will stay normal. It will stay normal. That's the problem. It will be normal. Normal or high. So mostly normal. So that's the tricky part for the student. They are like, okay, so what does heart failure mean then? If you are telling me that the ejection fraction will be normal, how can it be diastolic heart failure? How can it be heart failure? It does not make sense. Well, guys, heart failure is the heart inability to do its function. The function is of your heart is both to eject the blood outside of the heart and to accommodate to a new, a new blood. So, in case of systolic, blood uh, systolic heart failure, the heart is unable to eject the blood out, so that's problematic. But also, he is unable to get a new blood in, uh, in case of diastolic heart failure. And that's the problem in that case. The next thing I want to tell you guys is regarding the uh, something called uh, right heart failure versus left heart failure. The right heart failure issue goes something like this. If we speak about right heart failure, um, it's a diagnosis of signs, while left heart failure is diagnosis of symptoms. What does that mean? Left heart failure, when you have it, you, your blood uh, uh, will go from your left heart to your lung. If the blood is going to your lung, you are going to have pulmonary edema and you are going to have basilar crackles. Guys, can you see with your eyes dyspnea? You cannot. It's subjective of the patient. So since it's subjective, it's just symptoms of the patient that tells you. You cannot see dyspnea. You cannot see orthopnea. You cannot see noctopnea. Um, these are stuff that you are unable to see, but the patient will tell you that he has. So this is considered uh, all symptoms. And when I tell you about left heart failure, it's a diagnosis of symptoms, which all of them are basically stuff that the patient tell you that they exist, but you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot see yourself. So all of these are in left heart failure. Okay, so what about right heart failure? It is a diagnosis of signs. Signs are stuff that you are able to see with your own eyes without the help of any instrument, instruments. For example, can you see a GVB? Can you see a jugular venous distension? Can you see that? Of course you can. You just like, take a look at the neck and you will see a GVD. It's quite obvious. You can, you can just Google it even. Look at the neck and you will see a GVD. See? Yeah, you see that, you have, uh, you are like, okay, this, pay, this lady is suffering from right heart failure. Okay, so if we speak about uh, people who have right heart failure, other stuff that they can be suffering from include um, GVD, hepatomegaly. Can you palpate hepatomegaly with your hand without using any instrument? The answer is yes. What about pitting edema? Can you see pitting edema with your eyes? The answer is yes. So let's notice what they write for us. Heart failure, a clinical syndrome of cardiac pump dysfunction, leading to congestion and low, low perfusion of like peripheral organs. The symptoms include dyspnea, uh, which is like difficulty breathing, orthopnea, which is like difficulty breathing when laying down in a flat position, and uh, fatigue. 
Signs include S3 hard sounds, rails, and jugular venous distension, and the pitting edema, as you can see. And we have systolic dysfunction. Systolic dysfunction will be as follows. There will be a reduced ejection fraction in case of systolic dysfunction. So the ejection fraction will go down big time and the end diastolic volume will go up. So end diastolic volume goes up. So let's think about it. Systolic dysfunction, it's a problem in the contraction. So the ejection fraction will go down. So this is exactly what I was telling you here. It's heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So uh, the end diastolic volume, since the contraction is not pushing the blood forward, it will accumulate backward. So there will be more preload, more end diastolic volume. Less contractility is often secondary to ischemia or MI or dilated cardiomyopathies. Okay, so let's speak about the fact of uh, diastolic dysfunction. In case of diastolic dysfunction, the problem is in the relaxation of the heart. The heart is unable to relax. If that is the case, uh, the ejection fraction will be intact. So the ejection fraction will be um, intact, it will not be touched, and thus the end diastolic volume will also not be touched. But what is the problem? The problem is in the relaxation, okay? So the heart is not able to relax. So the compliance of the heart is going down. If the compliance going down, the pressure, uh, the elasticity of the heart will go up. And that will lead to an increase in the end diastolic pressure. Not volume, it's pressure. Don't confuse the two. So why the pressure is up? Because the ability of the left ventricle to relax is low. So the pressure will be much higher. And it's often secondary to myocardial hypertrophy. Okay, so it's secondary to myocardial hypertrophy. Okay, so right heart failure is most often a result of left heart failure. So wait a second, you are telling me that if you have left heart failure, it can be right heart failure? The answer is yes. Um, if we compare it with, um, so yeah, left heart failure can lead to right heart failure and also it can lead to uh, um, like all of the systemic findings and uh, like all of the signs that we can see in right heart failure. So you need to be really, really attentive in this one actually. If I make something like this, uh huh, uh huh. So, I'm telling you that left heart failure can lead to right heart failure. Right heart failure can lead to all of the signs, not symptoms, but signs. Remember, symptoms are subjective stuff that the patient can tell you. Signs are stuff that are objectives, stuff that you can see with your eyes. So, okay, if the patient has left heart failure and he has right heart failure together, we call it congestive heart failure okay if both of these are together we call it congestive heart failure okay so the next deal here we have as follows um, we have something that says um, it says something like this right heart failure is most likely a result of left heart failure there is something called core pulmonale which refers to isolated right heart failure to, due to a pulmonary cause Let's imagine, oh sorry, let's imagine that we have a patient who's suffering from COBD, which is chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. So this is his lung and his lung is getting messed up big time. Um, and here is his pulmonary artery, okay? So what will happen to your, the pressure inside of the pulmonary artery if, all of, if, if your lung is, in a, is a, in a diseased fashion, like it has a lot of fibrosis in it? What will happen to the pressure inside of the pulmonary artery? Tell me, please. So the pressure inside of the pulmonary artery will go up. Excellent. So if the pressure inside of the pulmonary artery will go up, what will happen to the pressure inside of the right ventricle? Excellent. So that will be up as well. So yeah, I was going to explain this in new in pulmonology, but apparently somebody already know it. This pulmonary artery, um, uh, it has minor vessels. And these vessels go to the alveoles, yeah? 
In case of COBD, um, there is poor uh, ventilation to this area. And did you remember when we said that the only organ in your body, when you have reduced oxygenation to it, it has vasoconstriction instead of vasodilatation. That was the lung. So in the lung, when you have poor oxygen going to the vessel, you will have vasoconstriction of this, vasoconstriction of this. If you have vasoconstriction of these guys, the diameter will go down. When the diameter go down, the pulmonary pressure will go up, right ventricular pressure go up, right atrial pressure go up, and GVD will be present. Okay, good. So that's core pulmonale. So ACE inhibitor and angiotensin 2 receptor blocker can be utilized. Both of these decrease your afterload and thus allow your heart to wash the blood in a much easier fashion. Beta blocker on the other hand are perfecto, but we don't like to use them in an acute decompensated heart failure. Because keep in mind that beta blockers are nice because they allow you to have more blood inside of your left ventricle due to the decreased heart rate. Do not forget that beta blockers can decrease your contractility. If beta blockers can reduce contractility, it sounds like a really bad idea to give them in a, de a decompensated patient with heart failure. Because if his cardiac output is 20, you don't want to make it 10. Trust me, you will kill him. So, and the spironolactone decreases the, mortal, uh, the mortality. If they ask you how, guys, basically it decreases the remodeling of the heart. It decreases the remodeling of the heart. Okay. If you are interested in scientific work, you will discover that actually aldosterone itself is the main reason why you, we have remodeling of our heart. That's why practically if you use any drug that works on the RAS system, that will reduce the uh, remodeling of the heart. Okay, loop and thiazide diuretic are used mainly for, uh, for symptomatic relief. Yes, but they do not change the mortality. Why? Because they do not work on the RAS system. Okay? So hydralazine and nitrate therapy improve the symptoms and mortality in select patients. Like if you select a portion of patient, these guys, uh, the hydralazine and the nitrates, uh, can improve both the symptoms and the mortality. Question time. Nitrates works on vein or on arteries? Tell me please. Does nitrate works in vein or artery? No vein. Uh, does does nitrate work on the veins, or does nitrate work on arteries? Veins. The answer is veins. Nitrate work on veins, not arteries, guys. And hydralazine works on arteries. Hydralazine's artery. Nitrate veins. Okay, again, nitrates, veins, hydralazines, arteries. We like hydralazines in a pregnant ladies. Okay, now left heart failure, right heart failure. Let's start with left heart failure. I told you it's a diagnosis of symptoms or signs. Okay, yeah, it's a diagnosis of symptoms. Okay, so these symptoms include orthopnea, paroxysmal nectorial dyspnea, and pulmonary edema. So these all are symptoms that you cannot observe with your own eye. So we have shortness of a breath when subine, increased venous return. Uh, so yeah, when, when he lays down in a subine position, he starts developing the symptoms. So that, uh, that is basically characteristic of what? That's characteristic of orthopnea. Shortness of breath when subine. When do we get subine? When we go to sleep, so when we are laying on bed at the end of the day. Uh, so they write, there is an increased venous return from the uh, redistribution of the blood. Why? Because the moment you lay down, guys, the moment you lay down, all of the blood from your legs go to your uh, inferior uh, vena cava. And that leads to a significant increase in the preload at that moment. Okay? Exactly, and when they go to sleep, they have so many bellows like under their head. I actually was once diagnosed a patient just because of the bellows. Uh, she had significant amount of bellows 
on her bed i got confused i was like can you tell me please why do you have so many bellows see she was hospitalized uh, hospitalized for asthma and then i noticed the pillows i told her why do you have so many bellows she was like they th i feel uncomfortable without so many bellows i cannot breathe because of my wink wink asthma and then in the end i i, I take took a look at her ecg the qrs complexes are all li really narrow in all of the, her heart and then i took a look at her chest x-ray she had like hypervascularity of all of his her lung basically she has congestion and then i was like we need to do you an echo we did the echo guess what ejection fraction is 40 so heart failure she does not have asthma so yeah i felt like dr house so it's uh, nice actually to know about that pillow trick so the next one is about um, like we have orthopnea Orthopnea, sh a shortness of the breath when subine, increased venous return from the redistribution of the blood. Immediate gravity effect, exacerbate pulmonary vascular congestion. So the lung is basically is in a messed up position. And when you like move, lay down, more blood is going inside of your right heart. If more blood is going inside of your right heart, you will have over accumulation of the blood in your right heart which leads to exacerbation of the symptoms so let's take a look here the next thing is paroxysmal nectorial dyspnea in which the problem is happening like when they go to sleep they start uh, waking up from their sleep like frightening at night because they are short of a breath it's a breathless awakening from sleep Increased venous return from redistribution of the blood. Uh, reabsorption of peripheral edema. And uh, so let's let's speak about this for a little bit. So when you lay down, guys, at the end of the day, you are sleeping, all fine. The blood will be moving from your lower extremity back to your heart. That's horrible for heart failure. But to make the matter worse, when you are sleeping, mostly you have your legs like a little bit up yeah when they are up this fluid like this interstitial fluid of the edema will be going back to where to your lung when it goes back to your lung what will happen to you you will become short of a breath so yeah you get two in one so pulmonary edema pulmonary edema is due to the, uh, to an increased pulmonary venous pressure pulmonary veno uh, which can lead eventually to pulmonary venous distension and the transduction of a fluid transduction of a fluid so what does that mean well let's imagine someone with left heart uh, failure left heart failure his lungs will be congested with all of that fluid so the hydrostatic pressure inside of your pulmonary vein will be high or low hydrostatic pressure inside of the pulmonary vein high low tell me please The hydrostatic pressure inside of your pulmonary vein in case of left heart failure will be high why let's take a look if you have here your left atrium left ventricle and an aorta here are the pulmonary veins And in case of left heart failure, the blood cannot go forward, so it accumulates backward. So there is more blood inside of the pulmonary vein. If there is more blood inside of the pulmonary vein, the hydrostatic pressure will be higher in the pulmonary vein. If there is higher pulmonary pressure, a higher hydrostatic pressure inside of the pulmonary vein, you will have more transduction of the fluid from the vessels to the interstitium, which can lead to pulmonary edema. This is the idea of pulmonary edema. Okay, so in case of increased pulmonary venous pressure, pulmonary venous distension will occur and the transduction of the fluid will occur. Eventually, the patient will be suffering from hemosiderine laden, laden macrophages. Guys, heart failure cells are look like this it's just like uh, some blood is uh, kind of extravasated 
from the pulmonary vessels to the outside and the macrophages eat it so but be careful heart this is characteristic of heart failure we call it heart failure cell heart failure cell if they t tell you which organ they are located at do not write the heart it's wrong heart failure cells are located in the lungs okay heart failure cells are located in the lung you must know this okay last thing before the break i will tell you this when we come back we will explain this graph you need to be more awake for it so right heart failure the patient will be suffering from hepatomegaly uh, because of um, oh yeah they love to ask about it so in case of right heart failure we said diagnosis of signs not symptoms signs so the patient will have more venous pressure more venous pressure lead to what uh, basically congestion of your liver congestion of your liver lead to more uh, um, you, uh, you, like this is in the central vein is it central vein by the way is it more near the zone 3 or zone 1 of the river it's zone 3 guys when we reach the GIT we are going to speak about this uh, but basically if you take a look here uh, hepatic vein it's also the central vein called uh, this one here in the triad, this is comes from the portal vein, while this one comes from the central vein, the hepatic vein. So this will be congested. This will be congested in the middle, initially. Okay. So hepatomegaly, the patient will have increased central venous pressure, more resistance to portal flow. Rarely, they can have something called cardiac cirrhosis. So let's take a look at a nutmeg. I hope you know, guys, what is a nutmeg. It's like a nut. So first of all, I will show you a normal nutmeg. It looks like this. And then I'm going to show you a liver. So this is a nutmeg liver, as you can see. This is a central vein here. Okay, so and this is a gross picture of it. Beautiful, I know. So. Also, GVD will occur due to increased venous pressure. And finally, peripheral edema due to increased venous pressure, which lead to an increase in the hydrostatic pressure and thus fluid transduction. Really quick differential diagnosis between the edema. Uh, if the patient has edema, if, it's, if it is more on the legs, is it kidney or heart? If the edema is more on the legs, yeah it will be in the heart mostly it could be in the kidney but mostly in the heart if the edema is mostly on the face kidney or heart kidney if the um, if the edema is more in the morning it's the kidney why you have not bead all all night long you did not go to the bathroom to urinate all night long so you have accumulation of fluid if the edema is worse in the evening before you go to sleep yes it's the heart heart failure excellent okay let's take a little break now come back after the break and finish up with this thing I'm going to continue with this so you can see here different forms of heart failures and you have systolic diastolic heart failure how each of them goes you must understand these topics to start with let's speak about this graph down here so you can see in this graph down here that the patient is suffering from what he has pulmonary arterial hypertension which is in this case um it's it's uh, not uh, well let's consider it due to pulmonary dysfunction like cobd for example so, um, if we speak about uh, uh, this problem, which is like COBD, COBD will have a low BCWB, but, but if it was a heart failure leading to this problem, like pulmonary arterial hypertension, what will happen to the BCWB? In case of heart failure, the BCWB will go up, but in case of lung problem, 
um, in case of lung problem, the BCWB, what will happen to it? It will stay normal. So again, let me show you what is happening. So here you have the bum. Here you have the lung. Here you have the other portion of the heart. So left heart, right heart. If the dysfunction was in the heart right here, the left atrial pressure will be much higher. And if the left atrial pressure was much higher, what represents the left atrial pressure? when we check it with the Swan's Gans catheter. BCWB. So in left heart failure, what will happen to the BCWB? Increased, excellent. While in the lung pathology, let's say the patient has like COBD or COVID or freaking whatever what lung pathology. What will happen to the BCWB in that case? Normal, exactly, it's normal, it's not touched. Okay, so yeah, you can see also here what they write. Let's see. First of all, the, why, why, okay, so the BCWB, why it's not touched in case of pulmonary problem? Well, what does the BCWB represent? It represents the left atrium pressure, yeah? So, uh, yes, it represents the left atrium pressure. And in case of lung pathology, the left atrium is not touched. Be like, no, 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 but we check the capillaries. We check the capillaries inside of the lung. But yeah, we inflate a freaking balloon inside of it. We, freak, we inflate that balloon inside of the little vessel. So you will not get any pressure from the back. You will only be getting the pressure from the left atrium. That's why we inflate the balloon there. So you can see that uh, the main idea with the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure is to check the left atrium and in case of lung pathology it will not be touched okay because the left atrium is not touched in lung pathology so you can see up here that left ventricular contractility is down in case of uh, let's say systolic heart failure so what happens to the cardiac output obviously it will be down what is going to happen to the bcwb guys left ventricular contractility is low so the BCWB will be higher low come on guys in case of low ventricular okay yes it will be high okay it will be high um, and uh, so you can see that it will be high so in case of um, but that will lead also to pulmonary venous congestion. So there will be an impaired gas exchange. That's one because come on, you cannot move in that ridiculous pressure. Pulmonary edema as well because we said the hydrostatic pressure will be high. Reduced right ventricle output. Why? Because of the increased afterload of the right ventricle. So when the right ventricular Output, uh, right ventricular output in, uh, decreases, your systemic venous pressure will go up. When the systemic venous pressure goes much, much higher, you are going to have a peripheral edema. Guys, tell me, this is a peripheral edema, will it be bitting or non bitting? It will be bitting. Keep in mind, kidney pathology, bitting. Heart problem, bitting. Thyroid problem, non bitting. Lymph problem, non bitting. Okay? So, albumin disturbances, bitting. Like a problem in the making of albumin due to cirrhosis, bitting. After mastectomy, lymphedema of the upper arm, non bitting. Because lymph is much more thicker. Uh, glycoaminoglycans accumulation, in which one? The lymphedema? The lymphedema is non-bitting. In case of uh, a thyroid problem leading to glycoaminoglycans accumulation, non-bitting. In case of albumin disturbance, it's bitting. Bitting, bitting. Albumin disturbance, imagine you have less encotic pressure, yeah? 
Um, so if you have uh, reduced enchoatic pressure, uh, that will lead to disturbance of the fluid. The more fluid will be seeping from the vessel into the interstitium. The movement of, of the fluid from the uh, vessels into the interstitium will lead to creation of pitting edema. So there will be more systemic venous pressure and that lead to peripheral edema. Keep in mind that the increase in systemic venous pressure can increase your preload and increase your cardiac output as well. Okay, let's take it from this side. When you have a, a reduced left ventricular contractility, you have low cardiac output. When that is the case, there will be less perfusion to the kidney. That will lead to increased activation of the RAS system. When the RAS system is activated, there will be more renal uh, sodium and water reabsorption. And uh, due to function of which hormone, guys? Which hormone lead to this? More renal, sodium, and water reabsorption. Aldosterone, exactly. So, um, and that leads to increase in the systemic venous pressure, which increases the preload again. See this cycle? Okay, decrease in the cardiac output increases sympathetic activity. Sympathetic activity activates the RAS. Also, sympathetic activity increases the left ventricular contractility, which is like what you want to do, which increases the preload and cardiac output. As you can see, the heart, when he gets heart failure, he always tries to protect himself. That's why drugs that work at the RAS system are perfect, you know, because they are targeting the pathogenesis itself. Let's take a look here. If you take a look here, this is like um, heart failure. Little r represents uh, reduced when the letter P represents preserved, reduced, preserved, reduced, preserved. So this is heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So he, uh, we saw this one before, guys. So here was the volume, here was the pressure, and here was the contractility curve. So. If someone has reduced contractility, what will happen to the volume inside of the left ventricle? It will increase. So you can see at the volume one, he's going to the right because it's increasing. Okay, so if someone has reduced ejection fraction, what will happen to the contractility? Up, down, just tell me, up or down? down okay you can see it going from here to here this is the down okay so the whole graph has shifted to this side good let's compare it with the preserved ejection fraction in case of a preserved ejection fraction it's a problem of relaxation okay so if we speak about the volume it's the problem with the relaxation so it will be the same the contractility it's not moving it's in the same place the only problem you have is in the compliance track, in the compliance curve. The compliance of the left ventricle decreases. If the compliance decreases, that means that you will have a serious problem in maintaining the diastole. So the diastole will be messed up. If the diastole will be messed up, that means no relaxation. Okay? So there is a little bit of poor flow but you are like wait a second but the but the volume here look the same well guys look at this square is it smaller than this one is it the smaller than the black one the answer is yes so the volume is mildly decreased actually not that much but still it is decreased okay so let's take a look at one more thing that you must know about if we speak Compliance mean less ventricular cavity. Look, if you speak about the word compliance, what is compliance? If you have a rubber band and you stretch it and it comes back, okay? So, I like this word compliance in English, what, what does it mean? So, if you have this rubber band and it stretches really, really good up and like big and small, big and small, big and small. You can say it's elastic, yeah? Look how elastic is this. It has good elasticity, yeah? Sounds good. Is it good for the heart to be super elastic? Well, if he is elastic, that's good. 
but if he is super elastic he will be dilating but not able to constrict for example yeah so you don't want him to be super elastic and at the same time you don't want him to have reduced elasticity you want something in the middle you don't want like to have like this and at the same time you don't have, want it like this you want it in the middle so you must know what is the relationship of elasticity with compliance okay so if you compare elasticity with compliance you must know that the higher the elasticity the lowest the compliance okay so let me find this for you uh, highest the yes okay so you can see elastance is the opposite of compliance the more elasticity you have the less the compliance for me personally the idea of compliance used to get me like really messed up so i just understood the one for elasticity and i just started to to try to imagine what happens in case of elasticity and whatever is tissue will be highly elastic that means that his compliance will be high or low if the tissue is highly elastic what happens to its compliance high or low low yes because the relationship between the two is inverse you must know this and if we speak here about this tissue if we speak here they said that the compliance is is pretty low yeah you're like oh so the elasticity is high why is he unable to relax you know it does not make sense why he is unable to relax because look if you stretch him like this he's highly elastic you stretch him and he does not want you stretch like this and like mm, mm. the startling mechanism in, in him is ridiculous you push him a little bit to the outside and he pushed to the inside really quick so you are not able to accommodate for more blood so again if the heart is here you push more blood in it compliance goes down elasticity goes up it pushes back like this so when it got pushed like this come on if you will keep doing this you will never get enough blood inside of the left ventricle so that's the idea so if you speak about drugs that decreases the mortality which drug decreases the mortality in case of heart failure spironolactone or ACE inhibitor beta blocker anything that works on the RAS system and the drugs that do not decrease the mortality which drug does not decrease the mortality diuretics and digoxin okay so let's take a look here now I'm going to speak about shock I will not go too deep just superficial explanation because we don't have a lot of time uh, and tomorrow we'll continue it because shock deserves a lot from us so shock it's an uh, what is the idea of shock a lot of people say shock is hypotension you might see such thing in your university it does not mean that it's always a true because some forms of shock does not have sometimes uh, hypotension so you need to be careful about that so overall yes shock can lead to hypotension but it does not mean that you will always see it so be careful the definition of shock that the organ that the blood is going to has an inadequate perfusion okay so there is an, 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 an inadequate perfusion to some organ that's the idea inadequate organ perfusion and delivery of a nutrient necessary for normal tissue or cellular function so poor perfusion to that organ how come that is possible well let's take a look if we imagine if we have a cell here and there is a vessel supplying this cell okay this vessel is supplying this cell if this vessel becomes uh, vaso dilated what will happen to the speed of the flow inside of it if it's vaso dilated it will decrease the speed of the flow will go down if the speed of the flow will go down the perfusion to the end organ will go down as well if 
uh, it will go down to the end organ like here what will happen to the patient you got it it's ischemia to that organ it will die so initially it may be reversible but life-threatening if not treated promptly there is four main types and each type has subtypes so let's start with the first one the hypovolemic shock Hypovolemic shock can be due to any cause that can reduce in the volume of the fluid inside of the body. The first one is hemorrhage. How many liters of blood do you have inside of your body? It's around 5 to 6 liters. Guys, you are doctors. You must know how to calculate how much, no, how much fluid do you have in your body. It's 7% of your total body weight. So if you weigh 60 kilograms, you have 4.2. Okay. I was asking, I said, why dilatation of the vein increases? It decreases the blood flow. Well, um, if you dilate the vein, there will be less preload in the heart, not more preload. Dilatation of the vein will lead to less preload, okay? Less preload to the heart, of course, because more blood will be inside of the vein. It will be boiling inside of the vein, okay? So more blood boiling inside of the vein, that will lead to less blood going to your heart, less preload. Okay, let's take a look here. So hypovolemic shock, we have hemorrhage, de dehydration, and burns. So hemorrhage, what is the big deal with hemorrhage? If you lose that 4.2 liters inside of your body, you get in a shock, obviously. Also dehydration, someone who is uh, like lost in the desert. Burns, well, burns seems off. Why burns can lead to it? Guys, when someone gets burned, they have these blisters, blisters of burn. And these blisters contain what? Blisters, burn. These blisters contain, ah, you can see that. But in massive, massive, um, like um, burn, they will be all over the body, you know? And uh, yes, exactly, third spacing. It's basically, they will have what inside of them? It's basically your plasma, you know? This is a plasma. And that's why they keep telling you, do not open them, do not open them. It's a plasma, it's actual plasma of the blood. And if you, if they get burst like in, in, a, in a huge amount, and all of your body will be kind of losing a lot of fluid. Because the main idea why they were created, it's due to the increased permeability of that vessels. The KF, if you remember about the KF, the KF was increased in this pathology. So what was the KF? If you remember in this, in this one, yes, this thing. Capillary permeability to fluid was increased in which case? We said it was in case of burns. Okay, so um, that led to the shock. So moving on with the shock, guys, all forms of shock except one will lead to cold and clammy skin. Why? Because they have less blood flow to the peripheral organs. So you will have cold and clammy skin. All of them except one. If you have a hypovolemic shock, you will have vasodilatation or constriction. Sorry, I apologize again. If you have a hypovolemic shock, you will have more blood or less blood inside of your body less blood so if you have less blood inside of your body will you have more preload or less preload less preload if you have less preload your cardiac output will go up or down down obviously why because there is nothing to push out there is no blood if your cardiac okay now it becomes the enemies guys Cardiac output and systemic vascular resistance hate each other. When one go down, the other goes up, always. It doesn't matter, it's always like this. If one of them goes down, the other one goes up. They just like hate each other, I don't know. Except in one case, there is always, always an exception. So, if the cardiac output goes down, there will be less perfusion to the kidneys. Less perfusion to the kidney will activate the RAS system. Activation of the RAS system will do what to your systemic vascular resistance? You know, you have angiotensine 2, you have aldosterone, the, all of these will increase your systemic vascular resistance. So the main treatment in the hypovolemic shock is to give them a fluid, obviously. So IV fluid is the treatment. Let's take a look at the graph I have here. 
So hypovolemic shock, the main problem is the decreased blood volume, which is we said you have more blood in your arteries or in your vein or in your vein. Where do you have more blood? In arteries or veins? Yes, it's in veins. Remember, two-thirds of your blood is located in your veins. So in get, if you get hypovolemic shock, less blood in your veins, less blood in your vein, less central venous pressure, less PCWB, less cardiac output that activate the RAS system, giving you more systemic vascular resistance. That was hypovolemic shock. Not that difficult. Let's speak about cardiogenic shock. Cardiogenic shock, it's due to an acute MI state and the patient will be basically having and suffering uh, from heart attack and heart failure. So the patient will also have valvular dysfunction and arrhythmias. So let's just speak a little bit about this acute MI. So if someone has acute MI, obviously the contractility goes down. Heart failure, contractility goes down. Valvular dysfunction, less cardiac output as well. Arrhythmias like VFIP or AFIP, less cardiac output as well. So the main pathology is in which one of these four, uh, in, in these three? Is it in the BCWB? Is it in the cardiac output? Or is it in the SBR? Where do you think is the main pathology? Yes, it's in the cardiac output. Is the main pathology in it? It will be significantly low. So there will be less perfusion to your kidney, which will increase your systemic vascular resistance. So for the BCWB, they write high or low. In general, if you have, um, let's say, a state of cardiogenic shock, what will happen to your BCWB? Well, it can be a little bit high because you don't have movement of forward of the blood, so it will be accumulating back. But they write it, you, uh, it can be high or low. So what is this high or low? Well, this is for different pathologies here. So the skin will be called anticlimate. I told you, it's on all of them except one. If we speak about an obstructive shock, and that's why they want you to they write this here, if you have cardiac tamponade, what will happen to your BCWB? Remember, tamponade is accumulating of the blood around your heart. It will be increasing because if we imagine the heart like this and the pericardium like this, if you have a humongous amount of blood in here, that will push the heart in. If the heart is pushed in, the pressure inside of your heart will go high. And thus, the BCWB will go up where it is. Yeah, in tamponade, it will go up. That will, oh, the cardiac tamponade, less preload, less cardiac output, less systemic, uh, more systemic vascular resistance as always. Pulmonary embolism, on the other hand, is interesting. If you have a BE, what will happen to your preload of your left, vent, of your left atrium and the BCWB? It will be decreased. There is less perfusion to your um, left heart, basically, because of the pulmonary embolism blocking the pulmonary arteries that supplies uh, the, the, the lung and, and thus supplies the pulmonary veins. So less the blood will be, so it will be low. Okay, so if your preload will be low, your cardiac output will go down and your systemic vascular resistance will go up. The same idea with tension of the menothorax. If you have tension of the menothorax, what will happen to your uh, superior vena cava? It will be collapsed as well, yeah, with the lung. And if your lung kit collapsed, collapses the superior vena cava with it, your preload will go up or down, down. Cardiac output go down, systemic vascular resistance goes up. Now it comes to the question, uh, how do you treat it? Cardiogenic shock, shock, anotropes. Can you give me an example of an anotropes? Anotropic drug? Come on guys, someone tell me about an anotropic drug. Dobutamine, melarinone, um, yeah, many exist. So diuresis, 
Digoxin is one, but we don't like to use it in an acute state because this drug is toxic and he's dangerous to deal with. Um, he, he's, he's a playboy, seriously. He keeps like sometimes he has a really narrow therapeutic index. Keep, give a little bit less of it, it won't, won't work. Give it a little bit more of it, you kill the patient. So it's dangerous. And diuresis in case of cardiogenic shock. Obstructive shock like tamponade, pulmonary embolism, or tension pneumothorax, just fix the problem, relieve the obstruction. The last thing is about distributive shock. Distributive shock could be sepsis, anaphylaxis, or CNS injury. The main idea, you have a massive vasodilatation of the body, everywhere. So, the main problem will be in the SVR, CO, or BCWB. The BCWB is the same as the preload of the left atrium, yes. Okay, so the main problem in case of distributive shock is vasodilatation of the peripheral vessels. Thus, your SVR will be the main thing decreasing, okay? So, if your SVR decreases, what will happen to your heart? Reflex, tachycardia, yeah? Okay, so please don't look at the one down there. Here, don't look at this one, just focus with me on this one. So, reflex tachycardia. So, in sepsis and anaphylaxis, you have a massive vasodilatation um, uh, leading to pretty much low systemic vascular resistance. In sepsis, this is mediated by the lipopolysaccharides. In anaphylaxis, this is mediated by histamine. Yeah? So, both of these can le lead to reduced systemic vascular resistance, which increases your cardiac output. If you have an increase in the cardiac output, cool, you have more blood going outside of your heart. But what else is vasodilating? Your veins. If your veins vasodilate, what will happen to the preload to the heart? It will be decreased because there will be pooling of the blood inside of the veins, reducing the BCWB and the preload to the left heart. Okay, so, so far so good. This is for sepsis and anaphylaxis. Notice, please. This, these led to vasodilatation of all of your peripheral vessels, including the vessels inside of your skin, which lead to warm and dry skin, which is the only one that is different from the other one. In case of shock, we always had cold, clammy skin. The only time that we did not have a cold, clammy skin was this one. Okay, so... The next one is about CNS injury. If someone gets a CNS injury, he will have destruction of his sympathetic nervous system. So his sympathetic nervous system will not be working. Your sympathetic nervous system, does it lead to vasoconstriction or dilatation? Constriction. So if it is not working, you will have vasoconstriction or dilatation. Dilatation, excellent. So, in case of vasodilatation, what will happen to the systemic vascular resistance? Reduced, awesome. Okay, in case of CNS injury or damage to the sympathetic nervous system, what will happen to the cardiac output? Normally, sympathetic increases, so in damage, it will be reduced. What will happen to the uh, venous tone? It will go down, so there will be vasodilatation as well. So, that will decrease the preload as well. Now let's take a look at the treatment then to the grass from first day, uh, from your ward. So the treatment of such septic shocks and um, anaphylactic shock include IV fluid, pressors like phenylephrine for example, and epinephrine. There is a few drugs I want you to memorize guys. The first drug is norepinephrine. Norebi, norebi is given for sepsis. Okay, you must know this. Dobutamine. We like to give it to cardiogenic shock. Okay? Back in the time they used to, to do dopamine, but not anymore. But keep in mind, not ebin and the epinephrine, epinephrine, we give it for what? Anaphylaxis. Okay? So, anaphylaxis, epinephrine, sepsis, nor epinephrine, cardiogenic shock, dobutamine. Make a note about this. Let's take a look. We spoke about hypovolemic shock. In case of cardiogenic shock, the main problem is in the heart. So the main thing that will be reduced is the cardiac output. So there will be... Okay, look. If you speak about the butamine, 
uh, uh, dopamine dopamine Uh, there is this mnemonic to remember which receptor it works at. It works in the D1 receptor, B1 receptor, and the alpha 1 receptor, according to the dose. So if you give low dose, it will be D1. Moderate dose, B1. A lot of dose, alpha 1. But we don't like to use it anymore because we found out that it can lead to mania a lot. So because it leads to the mania, we stopped using it and instead we use dobutamine. Dobutamine is the drug of choice now. Okay, so cardiogenic shock. So we have a reduced cardiac output, less perfusion to the kidney, increases your angiotensin 2, which increases your systemic vascular resistance. Uh, also, more backflow of the blood, increasing your BCWB and your CVB. Okay. Let's speak about obstructive shock. Obstructive shock, we spoke about, like in case of PE or tension of the pneumothorax. So in these two cases, there will be less blood going to the left atrium, which reduces your BCWB. That also increases your CVB. So if you have less BCWB, you will have less cardiac output and more systemic vascular resistance. Keep in mind, in case of cardiac tamponade, what happens to the BCWB, guys? Tell me. Increased. Excellent. So the last thing for today, class, is about septic shock. Can you tell me which drug do we like to use for septic shock? Nor EBI. Yes, not EBI. EBI for anaphylaxis, nor EBI for sepsis and dobutamine for cardiogenic shock okay so septic or distributive shock the main problem will be in the vessels both arterioles and venules so your systemic vascular resistance will be mainly decreased and your cvb will be decreased that reduces your bcwb when you get a low svr your cardiac output you will get what reflex the key cardio and that's it for today. Um, I, I think today th these concepts are difficult. I don't know if you liked the ACG thing in the beginning of the class. Uh, I have to make a bull about it and uh, make sure if you like it or not and if I should do it again. Um, if you like it, I can like every single beginning of the class, like the moment we start, like for 10 minutes or 8 minutes, we can discuss a few ECGs, a few X-rays, if you like this. We'll see in the future. For now, that's it for today and I will see you later according to the schedule.